Scott Huntley is an instructor at Swizzy TAFE, teaching web, social media, database, and customizing content management systems. He recently has been involved in developing content for the TAFE online project. Scott is enthusiastic about the practical and innovative applications of the Internet of Things. And he'll be talking to us today about e-learning and the Internet of Things. So let's welcome Scott. Thank you. Uh, usually in these first slides I start with a joke. And usually it's about HTTP status codes. Now given the audience, I, I think that this audience already knows what HTTP P. Did I add an extra T? Okay, it doesn't matter. I think you guys know what status codes are. Um, why doesn't the general public know about them? Because 200 is usually a good thing. So nobody sees a 200. So most people don't see 200. Uh, but then I go through a couple others, like 401, 403, 401, 404, 501, all these ones. And I always end with the, the classic 418, which is I'm a teapot. And I think some of you might be aware of that one. 418 means I'm a teapot. And it's an April Fool's Day joke, but I always like to start with this because it's a good gag and it gets the, the crowd warmed up. And it's always reused in IoT talks. Everybody's always coming back to HTTP status code 418. Um, but I think it's kind of funny. I, I didn't know how the, that joke would play with this crowd, so I thought I'd go into more of a meta explanation of that joke. Um, usually I'm the tech guy talking to other educators, and today I'm an educator talking to tech people, and this is what's very intimidating. Um, programmers know, they all know all the bad jokes, they all love the bad puns, admit it, you guys tell some terrible puns. Uh, so, 418, good introduction to IoT. It's an April Fool's Day joke, but it's 2015, and that April Fool's Day joke is in a way prophecy. 418 means you're connecting to a teapot. And these days, what can we connect to? So this is e-learning and the Internet of Things. I'm Scott. I'm one of those fortunate middle people who goes by their middle name. Uh, so I think in all the official documentation, I'm Kenneth. Please don't call me Kenneth. That's my dad. Uh, I'm Canadian-Australian. You might have noticed an accent. Uh, I, I teach at Swizzy TAFE, which is southwestern Sydney. You can imagine, if you know about southwestern Sydney, that uh, what kind of people are there. And there's a couple challenges sometimes. It makes teaching interesting. Uh, it makes, it's always interesting to be a TAFE teacher when half your audience is there, half your audience, half your students are there because they, their parents said, you got to get out of the house today. But you know, it's, still, it's a challenge. Um, yes, yeah, so anyway, I'm an educator, but I don't want to misrepresent myself. What I'm not is somebody who has a PhD or is working on their PhD. I'm not like a super huge giant mind of the education community. Uh, I, in fact, don't hold any teaching qualifications other than a TAE 40115, which is the bare minimum you can get to teach at TAFE. Uh, it means I understand the legislative aspects, ASQA aspects of, of teaching uh, in Australia. Um, and I absolutely never use the word pedagogy. If anybody knows what pedagogy is, I'm sorry. So the rest of you don't need to know and don't even bother finding out. It's a terrible word. Um, yeah, so I'm a TAFE teacher. I teach web design, development, database, programming. We, in my intro, I forgot when I wrote that, that we're in the, doing the toll TAFE online project. And uh, interesting story, we're, we're going to teach a diploma in programming. And my head teacher and I, who we work together with these kind of projects. We were trying to pick a language, and we've been trying to pick, like Java is one of our language, and we've been trying to pick that second language for like eight months. And we always keep coming back to Python versus JavaScript. And we sat down like two weeks ago, okay, we really gotta get to this. Let's do Python, and we start going through the resources. And halfway through, she said, we're going to do JavaScript. So um, what's interesting is I don't know any Python, and neither does she. So that's why we keep switching back and forth. So <laughs> it's gonna be a fun time. Um, I consider myself a hacker, but not that kind of hacker. So I'm not a sneak into systems, hold governments for ransom kind of hacker. I'm not a, I'm more of a hack something together quickly sense of the word. Uh, I'm a, I need more duct tape sense of the word. I'm one of those, oh God, please don't let me show my code to you guys. I'm one of those kinds of hackers. 
uh, I'm one of those, it's the night before my presentation, everything is broken, sense the word. I take it that happened to a lot of people last night, a lot of people were working on slides. Um, I more often identify with the right side of this picture. I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, I hacked together this presentation. I've done this talk twice, uh, once in Japan, once for Moodle Moot uh, Australia, which was a very big education conference, and that really kind of freaked me out. It was very particularly intimidating. Um, during that prep for the presentation, I realized I'm in the, with a whole lot of experts, and I need to stop presenting answers, and I need to start presenting questions. And uh, I kind of switched how I was going to do my talk, and that approach seemed to work there, and I think it's gonna have particular relevance here where I'm in with all these technical people. Um, I can't stress this enough, I am not a developer. Uh, because of the nature of my job, I have a very shallow but broad range of information, so I know a lot of like color theory, but when I say a lot, you start to go too far and I'm out of my depth. I know programming, but if you start to go too far, I'm out of my depth. Um, so you guys will, I'm out of my depth already. Um, but I like to do what's called the Socrates Mitnick approach. So it's kind of like uh, I just admit I know nothing, but still walk around like I belong. Um, and I, that seems to get me through. So what's the internet of things? Well, according to Huntley's Consolidated Dictionary, which is not a real thing, uh, Internet of Things is a noun, and it's a thing connected to the internet. Not a very practical definition, but anyway. Um, this definition seems to come up a lot. Smart cities, smart buildings, smart homes, smart cars, smart whatever, all these things connected, they're out of the future, they're connected to the internet, they can do all kinds of wonderful things. But we don't have them yet, so who cares? And that always leads to this question of, why don't we have flying cars? Everybody's always talking about what's coming in the future. And it was just uh, Back to the Future Day a few days ago, and we look at all the things that Back to the Future got wrong. So we don't have the hoverboards, we don't have the flying cars, and we're all angry about that. I like to turn that on its head, and I like to say, what do we have that's from the future that we have now? And if you start to think about it, it's amazing that we already are in the future and we hadn't even realized it. It's really the mundane that we have to track, not the amazing. What I mean by this is, the other day I was, this was a while ago, uh, a few months ago I was at the uh, local Caltex Woolies and I went to fill up my car and I realized that there's a television on the actual fuel pump and it's playing ads to me primarily but also weather and stuff like this. And I start to look around and I'm like, there's TVs on all these fuel pumps. And in fact, there's TVs on the front of the store because it's like the menu of all the things that they have inside the store, all these ads coming up. And I'm like, there's like six TVs there. And in fact, the sign, the petrol sign, that's a TV as well. And it's changing constantly. So there's TVs everywhere. And I realized, oh my God, if this car could fly, I'm in Blade Runner. It, it, we're there, this is the future. So. I reject that definition. I say that we do have an internet of things. We do have all these things around us. It might not be fully formed yet, but it's coming. And you won't notice it's coming because it will come in these small little doses and they'll be all around us even before we know it. So I like to define the internet of things as cool things I can make right now using a microcontroller board. So what's a microcontroller board? Uh, this right here is Arduino. It's designed by some Italian guys. I'm not even going to try to butcher their names. Uh, it's open source hardware. So what's really cool about that is they've actually put all the specs for building their Arduino board online. Anybody can download them. Anybody can make their version of their Arduino. And that's totally cool. It's used for a lot of DIY, do-it-yourself projects. Uh, they call this the makerspace, and it's getting very popular. And uh, it's a lot of fun. You can go out and buy a weather station, but why not build your own? That's a lot more fun. We're all geeks, we're all nerds, we're all hackers. Let's build our own stuff. Uh, so it's stuff that I've always wanted to play with, but I'm like the web guy, and I was never had that sort of courage to go out and do it. So last October, I said, you know what, stuff it. Nobody's doing this, the hardware teacher's not doing this. 
It's down to me, it's, it's the web guy. It's the guy who knows HTML who's gonna go out and play with fire. And so I just said, screw it, I'm gonna do it. So I have only really been doing this since October, really one year, and I started with one board that I bought from Little Bird and I found out that I actually like to collect boards. Um, it turns out my hobby is buying Arduino boards. So I've got the nice spectrum of colors and of or, and or authenticity. So this I took a few months ago, just of some of the boards I had lying around in my office. That's a SparkFun red board, uh, around 25 bucks in Australia. That's a one out of China. It's about five bucks, but I had to wait three weeks for it to actually arrive. And um, I had to download these weird drivers to get it to work with my Mac. And the hardest part was actually trying to use Google Translate to read the Chinese pages to actually figure out what file I need to download. But for five bucks, it was a pretty good deal once I got it up and running. That's the official authentic Arduino. It's about $35. Um, I'm disappointed because it's a new green one. I wanted the blue one. The blue one I think looks cooler. Um, that's okay because I bought a, you can't really see the colors on this, I bought a fake blue one that was around $15. It's made to look like an authentic Arduino, so there's still out there people out there, uh, what is that, doing knockoffs. And that's the Adafruit Metro board, about 30 bucks. So there's a wide range of actual, you know, buy-in that you could buy uh, and get involved in Arduino. I'll, I will say this, why would anybody ever pay the $35 for the official if you could get just the Chinese one for $5? Well, the Chinese one for $5 is really good if you've got a classroom and you gotta pay for all this. Uh, the $35 one though, that's actually sponsoring the Arduino Foundation. So you're actually putting the money back into the people developing new stuff. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, I can't tell you why you buy the other ones. I bought the Adafruit one because it looked cool. And that's, that's who I am. Um, so my good friend Jack, when I tweeted this picture, he asked me, does it come in purple? And he was like, we should start a Kickstarter fund to make it come in purple. And I was like, well, oh, I skipped a slide. We'll, we'll save the story about Jack in a second. What kind of things can you do with an Arduino? So lots of cool things. So you could build a countdown timer using retro Nixie tubes. And I actually have the Nixie tubes here. And during the demo port, portion of the show, depending upon time and or how much this all breaks on me. We might actually do this, set this up. So here's my Nixie tube. This isn't actually counting down, it's just shifting the numbers one over. But I really love the, the feel for this. This is kind of like old school technology. This is something you'd find out of, out of a Russian submarine or something like that. So it's actually the numbers are kind of like neon all stacked together in this tube. It's a really cool technology. I really love this stuff. Um, you could use it to build a clock or something like that. Um, anyway, yes, getting back to, where's my entire slide of this one? Yes, does it come up to purple? So Jack was asking me if it came in purple and uh, he was thinking about a Kickstarter to make one in purple. And I said, it does come in purple, but not really. The purple ones, and this is the color here you can barely see, uh, usually purple is reserved for things like the lily pad Arduino. And uh, lily pad, there's another version of this the, um, that Adafruit makes, the, the Flora. But what's cool about this, you notice these holes here. That's for sewable thread. So this is actually designed to make wearables. So uh, lily pad, they have all kinds of these wonderful the board, but also some other components, all designed for, for sewing. Um, and I've actually built my first, my first real IoT project was based on this lily pad design. So I forgot what my slides are. Yes, perfect. So actually what I built was a, a tie that was connected to the internet. And I thought, you know, everybody's always making shirts. I thought a tie, very um, fashionable, item of men's clothing, but really no real function. So I thought, I'm gonna actually make it do something. So this is my original design from February of this year. Um, and in fact, that's the, that's the Flora one. And it's hooked up to this, this side here, which is a, this is a Bluetooth. Now at the time, this was the only Bluetooth that I could get that would make it work. But I was actually connecting through my tie to my phone and able to process an RSS feed. And how I'd actually display stuff is on the other side of my tie, I had this, um, these are NeoPixels, so they actually change colors. They're, they're 
RGB pixels, so you could actually spit out the actual, make, turn this one on and make it red, turn this one on and make it blue. So I was reading a Moodle RSS feed, and every time a student sent a message, it would actually light up my tie. Or the other thing that I made it do was actually tell the temperature, so I actually had it change, and you could count how many lights were on, and that would tell you what the temperature was, and if it was orange, that was plus, if it was blue, it was minus, and uh, that was great. I didn't bring it today. The reason why is because in time, the actual sewing um, has short-circuited, so I have to do some major repairs for it, but I do still have the actual the, the layout board up here, and I might show that in a second. Um, the other thing was, this is all done on Ada cloth, and I always thought that was really funny that I'm using Adafruit technology, different spelling of the word Ada, but it was Ada on Ada, and two very uh, different technologies put together. But my wife is a cross-stitcher, so we had lots of Ada cloth, so. And I've already mentioned all this. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think is kind of amusing, that it's kind of an inside joke to me as a web developer, all the logic was in the back end and the display was in the front end, and it was literally the front of the tie versus the back of the tie. So, uh, like I said, I like a good pun. Yes, we've already done that. So, cool things that I could make right now using a microcontroller board. It's also cool things I could buy right now that are designed to connect to the internet. And I think this is an important thing. Like, for me, I like to play with the Internet of Things. I like to get into this maker space, and I actually like to work with the board itself. That said, I know a lot of educators out there don't have that desire. Sorry. So for me, it was very, oh, yeah, I'm back. So for me, it was very important to actually design some of my talk around this idea of using off-the-shelf components. And wouldn't you know it, every time I do this talk, I always leave something in the hotel room. So today what I left in the hotel room is my flower power um, uh, plant monitor. So I actually have a plant monitor that I've put into my garden and it will actually tell me what's the current soil conditions, what's the current soil temperature, what's the current fertilizer level, et cetera, et cetera. So it actually gives me feedback from my plant to, in this case, my iPhone. Um, I think that this is something that educators could use in the future. We could actually design lesson plans based around soil conditions or current plant conditions. So if you think of any kind of uh, trade where we're teaching about agriculture, horticulture, uh, even landscaping at TAFE, you can actually design entire lesson plans based around what's the current conditions, what's the current soil conditions. Um, I think this is, uh, this is where the future is going to move. This is how we're actually going to build our lesson plans. And uh, I have a number of other examples of that. So during the demo portion, I'm going to show you another cool toy. But I just realized I left something else down on me. Oh, demo time. Or as I like to call it, time to watch a grown man cry as everything fails miserably. So I wanted to build some cool things to actually kind of show everybody what I'm talking about. So. We'll start with my first one, and this is the one that I'm worried is going to die on me. Uh, okay, before I show that, what I'm going to do is switch over to my phone. Uh, yeah, the latest thing I built is called Mr. Hashtag. So my wife goes to a store called Spotlight, and at Spotlight, when I was in there with her one day, being dragged around, you know, typical husband, just like, oh my God, I want to leave, Spotlight's so boring. Um, I came across these things, and these are marquee letters. So they're actually like letters that you can paint and then put these LED Christmas lights inside them, and they're supposed to light up, and it's supposed to be all neat. This is all battery powered, and I thought, yeah, that's all right as it is. Let's do something really cool with it. So I bought one, and I thought, of course, I'm going to make it the hashtag symbol. That's what I'm going to buy. So I'll put it down here. And we'll see if this actually works. If not, then, you know, lunch is going to be early. Um, so I'll show this actually up on the, on the screen in a second. But I've got a particle photon board. And I'm going to put that inside here, if I remember how. All right. And 
this came out, so I'm going to make sure that's connected to ground. Where's ground? All right. So um, that's, that's, that, that's that part set up. So first, next thing I have to do is actually give it some Wi-Fi. So I'll plug this in, and while it's thinking, I'll talk about what I'm actually, what this thing actually is. So I've got another one, so I'll put it up on the big screen so I can actually show you what, what I just all plugged in. Where's my screen? Yeah. Uh, doo -doo. Okay. Yes. Hello, can I see this? Okay, so this here, this is the particle uh, photon. And what it is, this is actually one of those Arduino boards with, um, with Wi-Fi built into it. So it's actually got a Wi-Fi. This didn't work really well, does it? Uh, it's actually got a Wi-Fi built into it. So the cool thing is that it can connect to a Wi-Fi network without any kind of add-ons or anything like that. So I'm going to go down and make sure that my one down there is actually connected. Hopefully nobody will message me with anything embarrassing. Yes. So we're connected. Yes. So <laughs> uh, we are really playing with demo god fate here. Um, we're going to go next to my actual ift recipes. So I'm a big fan of ift. Do you guys all know what ift is? Yes? One, you guys don't know what ift is? Yeah, okay, a couple people. So I've got an ift recipe, and um, this one here will, if there's a new tweet, if there's a new tweet by me with the hashtag OSDC15, it's gonna call a function on my particle board. Now, if we actually go into that, edit that rule, you'll find that that function is on my particle, my hashman particle, and it's the make blink function. So in theory, if I make a tweet now uh, with the hashtag OSDC, that should light up and blink 20 times. Moment of fate, here we go. Uh, well, I actually come to my Twitter, look, 18 notifications. Huh. And we'll say, OMG, please work. And I'll send tweet. And just make sure that I actually tweeted that. OK, so now, is that blinking? No, no, that's fine. Uh, that's because it has to wait up to 30 seconds, or actually, um, later, I tested it for up to two minutes. You have to be very patient, or you could just do this. Check now. And it's blinking, yes, very good. So I thought, it'd be really cool if I get this up and running. So every time I tweet, it blinks that, um, but I thought, that's no fun. Why don't we set it up so that if anybody mentions my name and tweets with that hashtag, it will blink, and we'll leave that running for the rest of the today. Well, maybe not the rest of today, because it's a lot of. Um, or if you've heard about BuzzConf, you can send a tweet that says, have you heard about BuzzConf? And that will light up as well, just because. Um, so I hope that's working. Yes, good. Um, I promised that I'd show a couple other things while we were running this. Uh, go back to the camera. And I'll show it just here as a sort of a close-up. So this is one of these, it's called a wireless tag. And yeah, there it is right there. And uh, it's something that I, you can actually, I get spammed always. Buy one of these wireless tags, put it on your keys, never lose them again. And I was a sucker. I, I, well, I knew what I was doing. I bought it because they had an if channel. So I was like interested in, will this work with if, and if so, how well, and, and that sort of thing. I didn't do it for a live demo because I knew it would be a lot of setup. Um, one of the, some of the things you can do is you can measure temperature, you can measure if it's moved, you can measure if it's within range of the receiver. So they say that you can detect if something has entered the room. You can also make a blink and all that sort of stuff. So I, I bought one, and here's the thing. They're really the sucker. They sent me two. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, it was totally an accident. I got two. Uh, 
this is yet, and when I was talking about accessible technology for teachers, you can use IFT with this, and you can sort of set up some sort of application without actually knowing any sort of code. So I think that's an interesting thing, an interesting way that you can get people sort of involved in Internet of Things. Um, that said, this is actually a terrible product. It totally was rushed to market, and it hardly ever works the way that I want it to. But that's all right. OK, so earlier I was talking, I showed the, proto the particle photon board there. And I showed, see, I've got another one right here. Um, what I think is one of the interesting trends in IoT today is I actually have another version of it, which is bigger. And you usually think with tech, people are making things smaller. But here's a bigger one. So this is by SparkFun, a great company. Why on earth would they make a bigger one? Well, it's because it's the same form factor as all the other uh, current existing Arduino. So we can take an existing Arduino board and put it on top. So the particle photon is one of these boards that's got built-in Wi-Fi. I didn't actually have to add a Wi-Fi shield to it. And I think that right now we're seeing a switch from this original Arduino into the next generation where we see boards like this one, or we see boards like the uh, Bluetooth light blue, light blue beam, which has got built-in Bluetooth. I said that backwards. Um, so those boards all have the, the tech built into them. And we're going to start seeing uh, one of the ones that I've got on Kickstarter should be coming any day, the Udo. It's actually got Arduino. Plus, it's got built into it the Raspberry Pi. And I like Raspberry Pi as well. It's just I don't have a lot of good demos with it. I've used my Raspberry Pi to make an Atari 2600 because my parents never bought one for me when I was a kid. So take that, mom and dad. Um, I don't know if I'm going to show this on the phone because it's not really working. Some other really creative things. Uh, this here is conductive cloth. So with this, we were talking about wearables earlier. You could actually build some really interesting sort of wearables that connect with your IoT devices. So I was thinking something practical that you could do is you could actually build, say, a, uh, a dummy. What is those called? CPR dummy. So you could actually have the cloth on a pair of gloves, and you could actually measure where the people are putting their hands, and you could identify, is it in the correct position? So I think that that's something that we're going to start to see. Um, one of the things I left down in, the, down in my room was a eye beacon. Um, it doesn't matter. I, wasn't act I would just hold it. Imagine I have an eye beacon in my hand. Um, <laughs> so what I like about the eye beacons are it's a way that we can add location awareness, and it will work indoors as well as outdoors. I'm, yeah, I'll just switch back over to as I'm talking now. Sorry. Hmm. Yeah, so it adds location awareness indoors as well as outdoors. And we know that GPS location awareness has been around for a while. It's pretty, pretty common, pretty, uh, pretty standard thing. People can use it for you know, navigating Google Maps and stuff. But with the iBeacon, bringing that location awareness indoors, I can imagine people actually writing stuff like smart tours for students going around, say, a museum. And I think that's something that we're going to look forward to in the future. Uh, people are definitely working on this already. I've already seen smart tours based on iBeacons. But what I think about it, what I think you could do with it is you could actually make variants of a tour. So we're, we're well aware of these tours, where we, like the audio tours, where we walk around and we see things as the tour designer envisioned it. I think with things like iBeacons or even QR codes, any kind of sort of technology like that, where you can actually put in location awareness, you can have people walk around the museum and they can choose their path, they can choose their route, they can come back to it, back to a display, and maybe the second time they're at the display, it tells something different about a story. So if you think about uh, any typical museum, but even something culturally aware, something that people should get a, a message out of, something like walking around uh, Hiroshima. So when I went to Kyoto for my talk, I actually went to Hiroshima as well. I thought it was very important for me to see that place and see what happened there. And I think as students walk around, they could actually experience some of the events. They could actually see some of the stories get told to them. 
as they walk around using a, any kind of combination of this location aware technology. And I think the important thing is that it's not just a one time set the standard path, you can allow the students to go and explore on their own. And they can see different variants of that. Um, another thing that I wanted to show here, I haven't actually used this yet. I'm still not really sure. Actually, I do have a plan. I'll tell you about this in a second. This is conductive paint. And there's actually people who are building these Arduino boards designed to work with the uh, conductive paint. Um, just in that they've got bigger holes and you can actually paint with it. This one's actually in the form of a marker, so it's supposed to be even easier to use, but you can actually get it, so you get out the paintbrush or the roller and you can actually paint things. So I've seen Adafruit makes a really good video where they've actually painted a piano on the side of a building and students can come up and play the piano. And that's something that our college actually teaches music and that's something that I'm like, we, you have to let me do this over Christmas. I really wanna do this. I'm not getting quite the buy-in with that. Um, and it's kind of funny because I don't actually play piano. But I, I think that that's something that really creative that we'll be using in the future. Um, and I've already shown the conductive thread. Yeah, as always, I have so much and I always run out of time. Um, I have a rule for this. I take about half of my office home. I pack about half of that into my bag. And when I get to my, my hotel room, I take about half of that, and I only show a quarter of that during the actual demonstrations. Anyway, so I've just got the five minute mark, and uh, I wanted to leave it open. Now, I always close with two things. Number one, I, no, I close with, great, yeah. Uh, I close with this. When I went and did my talk at Moodle Moot Japan uh, on IoT, I saw this on the side of the building. And obviously, this is a poster, big, huge poster. Uh, designed for the students, keep innovating. And I don't really even understand what really a lot of it is, but I just saw that and I was like, I've got to snap a picture of that and show that to everybody. Keep innovating. That's definitely a message that I was like, I don't care if it was directed at those students, it's directed at me now. And it was directed at the delegates at that conference. And I think now it's, it's now directed at you. Keep innovating. We're uh, tech, we're, you're all the techies out there. You're all the developers. I'm here at the Open Source Developers Conference, and I'm kind of like, as a teacher, I'm asking you, please get involved in open source projects that include e-learning. I'm here advocating on my other fellow teachers' behalf. We need you. We need, we need help. So you guys are the innovators. We're all the innovators. Let's get out there and keep innovating. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. So, do we have some questions? Oh, yes, that was the other thing. I don't make time for questions, I make time for answers because I know that you guys are smarter than me. So, it's answer time. Please, give me your answers. <laughs> All right, so who has some if, answers? If that uh, totally threw off you off, I'm really sorry. Please, give me your question or answer. Well, we can always play Jeopardy. You can give your answer in the form of a question. <laughs> I just wanted to ask if you're doing any of these projects with your students. Are you actually building stuff in class or? We, uh, we have started to take that initiative. Now, uh, because my class, it was really difficult because I'm the web guy and a lot of people are like, this is hardware. What we started to do is some of these cheaper boards and, and so forth, my TAFE actually bought a few of them for me because we're actually using the Arduino platform to teach some of the programming concepts. So one of the, one of the units I get to teach is I have um, one that's um, oh, I forget the name of it now. I do it every day. If I was anyway, so it's new technology, it's emerging technologies. That's it. So as part of that, I'm like, we have to program something in Arduino, just make the lights blink or something like that, or even more complicated projects. Let's build something that tells the current temperature in the room, but we'll actually use it with the um, Ethernet board, so we can actually go and find out what's the actual temperature all around them. It only works inside that one room because of the Great Tape Firewall. They won't actually let us get out, but. But it is something that we're starting to look into more and more. I've had a little bit of pushback because I'm the web guy. I'm not supposed to be teaching hardware. But, but uh, I think if by showing the programming aspects of it, I think that I'm getting my other teachers on board. Yeah, that's great. I was going to say some of them have got little web servers, so you can always sneak in that one. Yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, I've, 
yeah, some of the boards up here, yeah. Yes. Thank you, Scott. That's good. That's great. Um, I haven't really got involved in any of those things yet, and I've always been a bit interested from the outside. So just wondering, um, are there certain, like, uh, like, if I were to get that one of those boards, and then you mentioned you've got something which is measuring the, you know, the water moisture levels in your pot plant or something. So I guess there must be some other device that you connect to that and then back to the board. I'm just wondering, where do you buy all these things and how do you learn about Ooh. how to connect these things? That's, that's a great question in terms of it really took me a long time to, f to find a good answer to where do I buy all this from. You'll find that there's a lot of stuff on eBay from China. And the advantage of that is it's cheap. The disadvantage is it's hard to use because it comes with Chinese documentation. My Mandarin is terrible. Uh, I found a couple de reputable detail de dealers. I don't know why I want to say detailers. Dealers in Australia that uh, actually sell Adafruit. And I don't want to like pitch just for Adafruit. I think um, SparkFun is also a great company. The, the advantage of these, this company, though, Adafruit and SparkFun, to a lesser extent, is they actually have a lot of tutorial demos. So their stuff is a lot more expensive. But I'm like, instead of a box of parts that I'm not sure how to use, I'm actually looking through, and I've got tutorials. I've got, I can, I can actually put it to work better. Um, Sorry, yeah. No, there's there's actually companies in Australia that sell Adafruit. Adafruit is more like the the brand name, whereas these companies are the distributor for Adafruit. Um, I don't really want to. You'll find them if you're just, yeah. just yeah. Uh, just to augment your answer, if I may. Yes, of course. Um, so, JCAR stock a line of products, uh, Australian owned and designed by Jonathan Oxer, who's a contributor to the Linux community. Okay. It's yeah. Well, his his company is called Freetronics. Um, so yes. you can buy Arduino gear, uh, not only the boards but displays and sensors and all the rest of it um, from JCAR. And at least in my experience, and I've used the Adafruit stuff. Um, um, similarly, the the modules are designed to operate together. So, for example, if you get an LCD panel and you want to run a temperature sensor, um, that's a common use case. So they make sure that if you just run their sample code, that the LCD panel and the temperature sensor module will run together without conflicting with each other. So it's that type of integration that um, beginning users can really hope to leverage from by buying from reputable companies. That's, that's a great point. Um, because that Arduino uh, interface is compatible, you, you can buy bits and pieces from different distributors, different companies, and, and make them work together. Also, I don't want you to, as a beginner, I don't want to, um, I want to give you some advice. Uh, don't be afraid of the needle and thread and doing the, the wearable stuff. I actually found, because I have a, a fear of like soldering, that seems very permanent, um, but sewing turns out to be a great tech skill. Who would have thunk it? But I actually find that um, putting together the, the wearables, that was, that's so much fun. You're actually there sewing through the Ada, and if you use Ada cloth, it makes it so, so much easier. Uh, so I built a lot of great wearable sort of version ones that got scrapped in the end. But, but uh, yeah, definitely don't be afraid of that. And I think that that's something that also when you take to your students, uh, well, I guess I'm talking to the wrong crowd. But uh, if you have students, if you take the the sewable stuff, it's something that also that they can you can teach that more easily, I think, and and get them actually building stuff quicker. Maybe one more. I heard that them clap, so they're going to start leaving for lunch soon. Yeah, I, I just wanted to do an addition correction to what what my neighbor here mentioned about about Freetronics. Um, Yes, there used to be a JCAR, will no longer be for all the products, but if you just go to, what is it, freetronics.com.au, it's actually cheaper there. Um, so that, that works really well there for, yeah, freetronics.com.au. Is J okay. JCAR isn't selling that anymore? Um, some interestingly bad things have happened. Inside um, baseball, we'll have to talk later. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Huh. Well, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Has anybody else tweeted? Did that only go off once, or has it been going off like crazy? <laughs>